Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I thank you all for joining us this afternoon for our very first BHS uh, virtual program uh, featuring Eric Nussbaum discussing his book, Stealing Home, in conversation with uh, David Roth. Uh, my name is Bo Mendez. I am the manager of programs and digital communications here at Brooklyn Historical Society. So it is my distinct honor and privilege to welcome you all here from wherever you are. Um, we are living through interesting times, uh, but if there's anything that working for a 155 year old institution that itself chronicles over 400 years of history, uh, if there's one thing that that has taught me, it's that every time is a little bit strange. And uh, Brooklyn has lived through so many different world-shaking events, uh, and we are going to keep on living through this one here. Um, we're very excited to get to this conversation. Uh, so just before we do that, I just want to share a little bit about who we are and what we do. Uh, Brooklyn Historical Society, as I mentioned, has uh, been around since 1863. We are dedicated to documenting, celebrating, and sharing the history of Brooklyn and things relating to Brooklyn uh, with all of you wonderful people. Uh, we do that through exhibitions, through the research that we, uh, that we conduct here with our crew of historians, uh, through our Othmer Library, which is uh, a research center that has been used by uh, academics, authors, school children, people conducting family genealogies, building research. Uh, I always like to say that anything you would want to know about Brooklyn and probably some stuff you don't want to know about Brooklyn is in here. And a lot of those resources are actually um, digitized and available online in addition to being uh, at the physical locations uh, that we have. Um, so um, without further ado, I would like to just go ahead and uh, share a little bit about how this program is going to work. Um, in just a moment, I will welcome our panelists, uh, David Roth and Eric Nussbaum uh, to begin the conversation. Um, we will have conversation with them for uh, a good bit, about 40-ish minutes or so, uh, give or take. Um, and then we will actually open up the floor for questions. Um, if you are an attendee and would like to ask a question, you can use the Q&A box, which uh, is located at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen. Um, in case you would like to see this program again, or if you know people that have not been able to join in, I know that we have a capacity limit on this program. We are recording this, and so we will be able to make this uh, available on our YouTube channel shortly after the program, and we'll send out information about that after the fact. Um, but again, we are very excited to be uh, doing programs like this. You know, um, one thing that you learn about history is the history of adaptation. And when new circumstances or different circumstances come along, good, be they good or bad, uh, people adapt. Uh, and right now we are doing that. Uh, this is, the, like I said, the first program that we're putting on ourselves, uh, but we already have more in the works. Uh, if you're interested in the census um, and the fight to keep the census fair uh, in the wake of things like citizenship questions, in the wake of things like uh, undercounting of historically underserved communities, uh, please join us on April 20th. Uh, in the evening, we're going to be hosting a conversation about legal efforts to preserve the fairness and the importance of the census here in 2020. Um, and that's probably enough out of me. You didn't come here to listen to me. Uh, so it is my uh, privilege to welcome our panelists. Uh, first, we have Eric Nussbaum, who is the author of Stealing Home, uh, Los Angeles, the Dodgers, and the Lives Caught in Between. He's also a writer and former editor at Vice. His work has appeared in Sports Illustrated, ESPN, The Magazine, The Daily Beast, Deadspin, and the Best American Sports Writing Anthology. He was born and raised in, in Los Angeles, so this story is very close to him, uh, but he's also lived and worked in Mexico City, New York, and Seattle. He now lives in Tacoma, Washington with his family. Uh, he'll be joined by David Roth, who was most recently an editor at Deadspin and has recently written for The New Yorker, The New Republic, The Baffler Food and Wine, and The Columbia Journalism Review. His story, Downward Spiral, also appeared in the Best American Sports Writing Anthology in 2018. He's from New Jersey and lives right here in New York. Uh, please welcome them. And for those of you all listening uh, from you know me and BHS, we hope everyone is staying safe and staying healthy. Um, and yeah, enjoy the program. I've been unmuted. Hello, friends. 
<laughs> How's it going, Eric? Pretty good, David. How you doing? Oh, normal. Everything's fine. I feel amazing, actually. You look normal. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. You look also look excellent, uh, you know, which is normal for you. Oh, we're muted again. Oh, now unmuted. David, are you still muted? David is still muted. I guess I will wait. I've been unmuted by the host. So Eric, like I was saying, uh, I feel amazing and everything is great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being censored for telling the truth about how good it is in New York right now. Um, but this is a good um, way to escape from that because I get to uh, talk to my buddy about a book that I liked very much about uh, something that I have always been kind of fascinated by, which is the city of Los Angeles and Dodger Stadium. Uh, I went to school out there um, in, well, I went to school in like the absolute far edge of LA County at Pomona College. So that's like basically San Bernardino County. But with Los Angeles, it all kind of um, is knitted together by large highways and uh, frequent Del Tacos. Like you can just go by those. There's one in every town all the way out. And the experience of, of being a baseball fan out there was mostly about going to Angels games for me, which was kind of grim. I remember going to one Dodgers game when I was in college. And all I remember from it is that it was Jay Payton's first major league RBI and my friend Matthew yelled at a child. Um, which Sounds is, like a Dodger game. Yeah, it was a Dodger game. I mean, it was fine. Uh, like, but I went back uh, years later and it was, I think, like the single most idyllic baseball experience that I have ever had, like just in the sort of touristic way that I was visiting Los Angeles at that time. We went to a bar called The Shortstop at the bottom of the hill in, I think, in Echo Park. And the beers were like $2. It was really nice. The music was good. A guy came up to us in the bar, just like cold calling us and was like, hey, are you guys ready for tamales? And we were like, yeah, I think so. And then he just sold us tamales out of a little cooler that he was pulling behind him. And then we walked up the hill to the baseball game and it smelled like flowers and the tamales were good. And then we got there and like D Gordon stole a base. And it was, I know not a realistic, you know, Los Angeles experience because for instance, we didn't drive uh, any of that that I just described, but there is something about it that seemed much closer to the heart of the city than any of the baseball experiences that I've ever had in New York. And that also kind of felt like the version of Los Angeles that I, as somebody who, you know, visits as often as I can and had a nice experience in school out there, always liked. And I know that you have visited Dodger Stadium many more times in your life than I have, because uh, all I've got is the Jay Payton game and the D Gordon game. But the stadium, I imagine, is a special place to you. Did you start with that in wanting to write the book, or did you sort of start with Los Angeles? Like, how, how did you come to this? I think I started with the stadium. I mean, my kind of origin story, my origin story, I'm not a superhero. The book's origin story. What a superhero would say. Is, uh, maybe, <laughs> that I loved going to Dodger games growing up in L.A., and when I was in high school, a man came to speak to my U.S. history class about McCarthyism and the Red Scare. And his name was Frank Wilkinson. And he had been a public housing official in LA. And he was sort of stooped and grandfatherly. And he told us Dodger Stadium should not exist. And for me, as like a 16 year old kid, this was heart wrenching and shocking. And he kind of proceeded to tell us his version of the story that's now in the book about public housing, about displacement, and about how LA ended up with my favorite building in LA, Dodger Stadium. So the, the way, the idea of the stadium sort of fitting into the city is I have this kind of like the romantic experience of it that I had, which was that it seemed like it was in a neighborhood. Gesundheit. Thank you. Yeah, and al allergies, I swear. Yeah, it's tough. I think that's, we, we're all dealing with it. It's cool. It's nice to do that systems check every time you <laughs> feel any sensation in your body. Uh, the, and yet like it, it does fit into a neighborhood such as it exists now, but there was, I mean, in the book, the, the story that you tell basically is how it came to get built over these three communities that kind of existed in, but not quite of LA at that time in the area that's now Chavez Ravine. 
Yeah, so the book really kind of tells the story of these three communities, Palo Verde, La Loma, and Bishop. And they were, you know, mostly Mexican, Mexican-American neighborhoods in LA that were sort of isolated. And in the late 40s, the city decided that these neighborhoods would be the ideal spot to build a super ambitious public housing project. It was going to have 3,600 units. It was designed by Richard Nitra, who's a big LA architect. It was going to totally like change the shape of the city. There would have been these giant towers overlooking downtown. I motioned with my arms. You couldn't see it on the screen. Uh, <laughs> the size of the towers. And before this kind of housing project could get built, but after nearly everybody in the communities had been pretty much kind of driven out with eminent domain, the Red Scare happened and sort of the city's real estate interests and conservative moneyed politician types use communism and anti-communism as a way to kill public housing in LA. And that renders this land mostly vacant, except for a few major exceptions, uh, which ultimately is what allows the city to lure Walter O'Malley from Brooklyn. Yeah, that's so. I want to get back to the. Sorry, um, that was a lot. No, that was no, it was good. Uh, it was the. I just want to like. I want to talk about those elites and that sort of like force of progress separately later because I think it's like. It, so I, um, at the risk of editorializing, I know nobody's here for it. Uh, this book absolutely whips ass. It's extremely good, and I'm biased because I like Eric, but it is. It's a, a Los Angeles story much more than it's a baseball story, and the way that all of these sorts of forces come together to make this stadium is I think a really like the book moves much more quickly than the average nonfiction book would because there's like that, that sort of animating force. And I want to get to it, but I think given that this is Brooklyn and given that uh, saying Walter O'Malley's name in Brooklyn is still something that <laughs> people are reluctant to do. I think that it's worth. Um, so I knew Walter O'Malley as a kid that, you know, my dad was a, Brooklyn Dodgers fan growing up and I read a lot of books about the Brooklyn Dodgers because there are so many books about the Brooklyn Dodgers a lot of books about you would not Dodgers. believe him and also always somehow more books about the Brooklyn Dodgers is really an, uh, a remarkable thing uh, I think it's just as long as my generation of, of dads are hanging around uh, there's always going to be some of that so O'Malley though it, it, in those stories was always kind of a, a villain like in the way that like a uh, baseball owners have sort of long been. This is the guy that wanted more money, tried to get it out of New York City, couldn't do it, and blew town. And the image of him that emerges in the book is not, I would say, uh, especially sympathetic. I mean, he's a rich guy who was very ambitious and um, really was about getting what he wanted. But there's stuff in there about like his vision for Dodger Stadium, but then also his vision for Ebbets Field is a lot of stuff that I wasn't really as, as familiar with. So he, I, I think that this is like an interesting sort of complication of his idea. Like this was a guy that really wanted to build a fantastic ballpark. Yeah, I mean, the way I kind of found him to be in my research and in my reading, you know, I read a lot of those books about the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, there was a really good oral history called Bums uh, by Peter Goenbach. And he gets into, that. he gets in a really good O'Malley psyche. He has this anecdote about O'Malley playing cards at spring training with reporters and when reporters are favorable to him he lets them win hands and he kind of like underhandedly kind of pays them off a little bit to, also as a reminder of who's in charge he's a very savvy person and he also felt very strongly about his vision for baseball he was not short on ego he was not short on ambition and he saw Ebbets Field um, and I think rightly as insufficient for the future of the Dodgers. Uh, Ebbets Field was falling apart. It was very small. Attendance was poor. It was not that easy to get to. And his real dream in the beginning was to build a stadium across from where the Barclays Center is now. Um, but that dream was scuttled by Robert Moses, this kind of equally, well, probably greater force in New York. And they had a really like a decade long sort of test of wills where O'Malley really wanted a privately owned stadium in Brooklyn, but he wanted a little help to get the land. And Robert Moses wanted him to move to Queens and play in what would become Shea Stadium. And O'Malley finally just said no, and he left. I mean, it was really 
kind of, if I can't get what I want to build the stadium I want here, I'm going to go there and build it. The stadium itself and like creating this sort of modern baseball experience, as he would have probably called it, was more important than where that stadium was. Even though O'Malley was really like a truly New York guy, his dad was a Tammany Hall operator. Like he like came from New York stock, had lived in New York his whole life. And, you know, uh, it was a big change and risk for him personally to take the Dodgers to LA. Yeah, there's all this stuff about, in, in the book, again, like some of the LA color. And Dodger Stadium sort of fits into this, like that mid-century Los Angeles it's a very particular to that place type of ambition. You write a little bit about the Clifton's cafeteria downtown that had like seven different floors, like a waterfall, a tree growing in it, like just stuff that was, is that the right place? I'm going to talk yeah, about that's the right the place, Clifton's. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's all of like that vision of like, not just, you know, New York, Chicago, like we're used to these sorts of like grand, large buildings with like, you know, overstated gargoyles on them and stuff. And Los Angeles was really working on a sort of a different level. Like it was, his, a, it was a much more Disney level. It was, it was literally like Walt Disney and Walter O'Malley sitting there talking about like how you can serve customers efficiently. Yeah, uh, they, that's, like that's uh, the actual conversations that they were having. I mean, these guys were reimagining sort of like private public spaces um, in a way that. I don't think we've really seen since then. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing that's kind of fascinating about as people that, that write about baseball a lot. I mean, it's in the absence of actual baseball, what you're basically writing about is uh, billionaires trying to get money from you know municipalities to do what you know whatever to like build some ugly stadium that they're going to tear down in 17 years. Dodger Stadium is old. No one wants to tear it down. Like it is still perfect. I mean, it's been improved. But it is really like of all the the sort of historic stadiums in baseball, it's one where, you know, like Fenway and Wrigley and stuff are like, they're cool places to watch a baseball game, but mostly because of the fact that they're old and have all this history in them. Like Dodger Stadium really is kind of this bizarre achievement in like trying to provide like a, a real, like a popular experience, cheap tickets like lots of different experiences available within the stadium outside of the, the game itself, all of which was like very contemporary and seems like in this sense, like to be like actually a vision realized. Yeah, I think it really was. I mean, when I was a kid, going to Dodger games, Dodger stadium felt old to me, but in a good way. And that like, you know, I liked it. it. It felt open and kind of, it felt good to be there. There's like a really good ambiance and vibe at Dodger stadium that, is sort of part of the landscaping and how, to, how the stadium sits in the hills and how it was built and the wavy roofs on the outfield bleachers and it's sort of like the mid-century modernist architecture combined with the landscaping, I guess, probably. But when it was built, it was super modern in not just the architectural style, but in its ambition for what a stadium could be. It was really built to be family-friendly, to be accessible to people of all incomes. It, he had a very, uh, ironically, considering how the stadium came to be, he had a very democratic and kind of open-spirited vision for baseball in Los Angeles. Yeah, and this is interesting because it does, like, as a vision realized that was, like, as you said, like, sort of broad-based, like, populist is such a loaded word, but I mean, it really was, like, something that was for people to enjoy, like, I mean, the other side of that is that it's built over those three neighborhoods, that they were removed through this concentrated effort of extremely cynical city elites over, you know, the efforts of people that were trying to either try to make those people's lives better as they saw it, which was, I imagine, how Frank Wilkinson would talk about it, or like just try to bring them into the city. And instead, the city's progress you know, like, not just in terms of O'Malley himself, who was a transplant, but in terms of the, the political players that brought him there, it seems like it just kind of devoured that in the way that it was, you know, doing a, a great deal of devouring around that time. Yeah, I think devouring is sort of a big theme of the book. And a lot of the book is about people's kind of best laid plans getting devoured by bigger plans, by bigger people. And sort of the bigger notions of like what a city is and what it can be 
and how power plays into that and how money plays into that. And in the case of these three communities, um, you know, they were pretty powerless, you know, despite the best efforts of people who live there, um, they had been marginalized, you know, they, the city came in and said, you know, these houses are not up to standard, even though many of them were. And even after decades of neglect and like not enforcing code and not providing sufficient infrastructure. So it's like, you know, that's not fair. And then once the city does that and decides that these communities don't deserve to exist anymore, then an even bigger fish comes in and eats that fish. And that, you know, that ends public housing. And all of a sudden you're left with a situation where eminent domain is used to extract private property for the benefit of another kind of private property owner. It's pretty tragic. Yeah. It's in reading the book. I mean, there's the sense, especially, I mean, it helps that you know where it ends up. I mean, that like I've been to Dodger stadium. So I kind of like in that sense, the, uh, that's a spoiler for the book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but there is also this sense in which like, how you get there, like you see this small community of Mexican American people that is sort of like treated with a, a not especially salutary neglect by the city. And then it's just a question of seeing how kind of progress comes for it. And the, the devouring that there's a lot of characters in the book that I find uh, very sort of interesting just as like, as Los Angeles types, but also just in terms of how they're carried along by the uh, the force that is remaking the city. The guy that um, I was especially interested in, again, as somebody that went to school nearish, I mean, closer to San Bernardino than I did to Los Angeles, is this character Ignacio Lopez, who's an activist and a columnist in San Bernardino, and then later winds up as Frank Wilkinson's right hand in the attempt to sort of remake the city. Yeah. So Ignacio Lopez grows up in sort of the Inland Empire, right? Uh, kind of near Pomona where David went to college. 99 and season. The, uh, he starts from his house, a Spanish language newspaper called El Espectador, and it becomes kind of a big hit. It's sort of like, he's an activist, you know, he's calling out discrimination. He sues the city governments when they don't, you know, when they segregate pools and movie theaters. Um, he runs Spanish speaking candidates for office. He, is a deeply committed kind of pre-Chicano Chicano activist, like before that kind of that phrase had come about and that movement really like took off. Um, and he his work ends up sort of becoming the foundation of that movement. But one of his big concerns is housing integration and housing segregation. You know, at the time LA was still pretty redlined and it was really hard for non-white people to buy property and to buy property where they wanted to. So public housing, one of the appeals of public housing, in addition to sort of ending homelessness and literally housing people, was that it could mandate integration. You could force integration into a community by, you know, building public housing there. So Lopez becomes a fan of, of this notion. He, to him, the sort of sovereignty of these communities is less important than the big picture of integrating public housing. And he becomes the the Spanish speaking sort of face of the public housing authority, uh, not, not called the public housing authority, but as they enter these communities and try to convince homeowners to sell their homes to the government for probably a not great price. And that's a, that's a tricky place to be. Yeah, there's a lot of that in the book in terms of these very, I mean, he has a very committed uh, character and Wilkinson too, I mean, as who was a member of the communist party really was very committed to I mean, in retrospect, like kind of a high handed social engineering version of, you know, improving conditions. But yeah. And I, but I think that's sort of like what the progressive movement was at the time. I mean, he was not exceptional in that he was a little, probably a little bit racist, even though he wouldn't have called himself that and that he was extremely high handed and like truly believed that social engineering is what people needed. Like that was that was the idea. Uh, that was the, the best idea amongst, you know, high-minded progressive people at the time. 
yeah, I mean, it's like, it could have been Robert Moses, you know, which means the buildings would have gotten built, but then they would have been hideous and people would have been living like they were in a personal storage facility. So it's- It's actually interesting. One of the concerns in within the public housing, like advocacy community in LA is, so they initially, you know, we're going to build kind of low bungalow type, type housing projects. And that's if you go to LA, you know, you'll see public housing projects there. That That's what they are. They're kind of garden apartments. Uh, the soil in, in the land that became Dodger Stadium didn't allow for that kind of sprawling vision. Uh, so they had to build towers. And none of this ended up happening, obviously. But when the switch was made from garden apartments to towers, a lot of housing advocates in LA backed out and said, no, we can't do this. It's not civilized. God forbid people have to live vertically in apartments. It's, it's not okay. Yeah, um, I have no comment on that at this time. The, <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely, I mean, whatever, that's, again, like sort of the- it's Deeply proto, California vision. Proto-nimbyism, yeah, like it's, Los Angeles starts everything. But the, for Wilkinson and for Lopez, and then for especially like the sort of, of the families that live in these communities, the uh, Arechiga family is the sort of the heart of the of the book, these people that, came from Mexico and, you know, built lives for themselves that were like sort of defiantly outside of Los Angeles in that community. Are, I mean, there's a lot of really like sort of bright line people in this book who really know what they're about. And yet, you know, including, you know, these completely rancid LA elite types who are, you know, want only to sort of minimize the public good and maximize the return on investment. And yet, like, almost all of them, like, nobody quite gets what they want. I mean, I think Walter O'Malley does. I guess Walter O'Malley does get he, what he wants. He comes, but yeah. and, and I think, like, the, the sort of L.A. elite kind of class does, you know, they, they win, ultimately, right? They, the communities that were there get destroyed and wrecked, uh, first by public housing and then by um, sort of the decision of the city to sell the land to Walter O'Malley. Uh, and then finally, the public housing advocates get wrecked as public housing kind of goes up in flames amidst the Red Scare uh, and amidst a campaign engineered really by the city's elite. Yeah. And then the, finally, you know, this kind of outside businessman comes to town and he builds a ballpark. And, you know, the money that he spent to build it was lent to him by Union Oil, It was, but which is an L.A. company. You know, it was truly a a coup, I think, of LA's kind of business elite. Although it would be unfair to characterize O'Malley as part of that plot. He really just kind of came in at the end and benefited. Yeah, he was the guy that had a baseball team. I mean, yeah. And like, but yeah, the, so again, this is, you know, I'm talking to you from the east part of the Upper East Side of New York City as somebody that just like likes visiting my friends and eating tacos and stuff. Like my understanding of Los Angeles is limited. This is all extremely Chinatown to me, though. Like, just the idea of this kind of, I mean, I know it's, it's real life, but the idea of, like, how elite coercion works in Los Angeles seems to sort of have a distinctive character to it relative to the way that it's always worked elsewhere. I was really skeptical when I started writing the book and started, like, really more researching that, you know, there's people who believe that, the city knew the Dodgers were coming like in 1948 before they even started planning the public housing project and that the whole thing was set up. I'd, I never found anything remotely approaching that reality. But what I did find was sort of a kind of consistent version of events where it's very clear who has power and how they wield it. And then that results end up kind of conveniently working out for them. Uh, like the Chandler family who owned the LA Times in the 50s, you know, used the paper, they also owned a ton of real estate in LA and they used the paper as just a political cudgel. It was truly a propaganda machine. You know, the City Hall reporter for the LA Times, this guy named Carlton Williams in the 50s, would literally like walk onto the council floor and whisper into the ears of counselors to tell them how to vote. It was, it was not a, um, it was not the LA Times we have today. And it's very clear just to kind of see the strings being pulled. It's it's not like hiding, it's, it's right there. Yeah, that's the part of it that is kind of like striking to me. And again, it's not like whatever, Tammany Hall was famous for its like 
subtlety either. Like that's not the, not the word you hear used the most no. often, but there is that like how, I mean, and there's bits that you quote from the Los Angeles times in the book that are just like shockingly reactionary, even if you know that it was a reactionary paper at the time that there is this element of not overstatement necessarily because they're not, it's a real story, but like, there's something about, again, like the, the Los Angeles-ness of it, that there is like, everything seems to be both not, you know, sort of closing of the frontier stuff, but then there's also this, uh, every character seems to represent the apotheosis of a type of character, like the most committed <laughs> communists, the most hardcore community activists, like the most abjectly shitty elites, the, the stadium of the future, all of that. That like starting, and again, this is like sort of the outside of it. And yet like you managed to work your way back towards the, the people themselves in it. Like how much, like the people, that sort of like animate the book, the Orachios or Wilkinson or the elites and stuff like that. How important was it for you to like pin down their motivations and, and feelings relative to the, the history of the thing? I think that everything in the book stems from wanting to pin down their emotions and feelings to the best I could, right? None of these mm -hmm. people are, are still alive and you don't want to, you don't want to like write thoughts into people's heads. Um, I tried not to do that and mm -hmm. I find it frustrating when books do that uh yeah. so but you can see their motivations you know they, they spoke their motivations they wrote about their motivations and i thought it was really fascinating to sort of understand why these people made the choices that they made like what was it about the Eretica family that caused them to remain on their land even as the city tried to take it from them and refused to leave and refused to leave and to protest publicly uh the public housing deal and the dodger deal and to really take it all the way to the end you know what what was it about them yeah, they're that like separated bodily them? removed from the home by yeah the ultimately they're violently removed from their house on television and they sit there and watch uh the government bulldoze it i mean the government like pulls them out of their house and brings in a bulldozer and just knocks it down right in front of them and what why did they make that choice you know what there's a i feel like it's maybe flannery o'connor phrase about the mystery of personality she calls it and I was really curious about that. And I tried to sort of to the do the best I could to understand it and relay it on the page. Um, I was also really interested in how these sort of regular people, you know, they weren't born into elite lives. They weren't born into fame, sort of became like thrown by the waves of history in such a way that, that their personalities and these giant forces combined to create this dramatic event. Yeah, this is, I mean, and the book is written in a, a very interesting way that like sort of, it, it, like that tension between small people and big forces, and then also the sort of the ways in which like people can be seen to act on these forces in sort of surprisingly effective ways is very much like in, built into like the narrative as the story is told. And so a little bit, I mean, I don't want to get too deep into it because like this could be, uh, talking shop and like the annoying way that like guitar guys are like, what kind of pedal are you using? But like the, the book itself is uh, very strikingly told. The timeline is kind of, it's all over the place. You're going big, you're going small, you're moving from one character to the next. Uh, it seems like it would be really difficult to write a book like that. Yeah, it was not easy. Uh, for pedals, I used a I used an old Dell, um, <laughs> an old Dell desktop with the internet card taken out. That was nice. that was what I used to write on. Yeah, um, a CD drive in it. Definitely has a CD drive in it. Tight, yeah, tight. That's and, great for um, CDs. That's I mean, <laughs> the, I I actually really wanted it to be chronological and to the best to the point that I could. And there's there is jumping around, um, but one of the reasons that, the book has a lot of short chapters in it. And part of the reason they're short chapters is because I wanted to give a sense of kind of what each force kind of in the book was doing at the same time. Like, you know, Frank Wilkinson's a major character in the book um, and Abrana Adechiga is a major character. And I wanted to be able to show them sort of parallel to each other. So some of the jumping is really just to kind of keep, keep you aware of what these people are doing and how their lives are gonna eventually, you know, tragically meet. 
later on. And I kind of was hoping there'd be some sort of sense of inevitability uh, from that. And then, you know, some of the stuff you make, you just kind of do your best to, to fit in, you know, the Mexican American war. Yeah. I mean, that's the part of it that like, there is a lot of, you know, Adder Doubleday appears, Santa Ana's wooden leg appears. It's not like, you know, you're not stretching it, but at the same time, like that's a, a, lot, a lot of ground. Santa Ana inventing chiclets, but then not getting any money off of it. Great little detail in there somehow. Kind of amazing, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, think about how much that product has, uh, has given us. But the, I mean, that's the part of it. I think there is like a, a tension in the story. I think all the time about how much, how chiclets. much chiclets have given us. I'm having a hard time concentrating right now <laughs> for that reason. But the, uh, the way that, I mean, what you talk about in terms of having, you know, teasing out the, the parallel lives of the different characters in it does create a sort of tension because you know from the beginning that Frank Wilkinson is going to be in, but because the story that you told about him showing up in your classes in the, the very introduction of the book. And yet when you see sort of his life where he's having these politically formative experiences, it was like after he was in a you know, sort of posh fraternity at USC. UCLA. UCLA, wow, that's an embarrassing mistake. Yeah, you can't mess that it's, one up. It's all right, yeah, lots of comments have lit up there. Uh, but <laughs> so then he goes to Europe and experiences, so the idea was that he wanted to go to the Holy Land and he sees poverty for the first time. And yeah, he he was a rich kid from Beverly Hills, pretty much a yeah. rich conservative kid, and his father was like a crusading doctor, like anti anti drinking, like a moralistic kind of guy, and he wanted to be a Methodist minister. Frank did, but once he gets to the Holy Land and gets to Europe, he realizes that there's poverty and there's there's bad things in the world, and he becomes an atheist and he has this radical transformation into, you know, a, a communist basically. Yeah. And that's happening at the same time as you're sort of tracing the Arechigas coming from an obscure and very poor part of Mexico and building this sort of like, you know, they, it was a very small life. Like they, they, you know, Abrana and them did not really seem like they were very much a part of the city. The kids were Americans, you know, or came, became them. But that tension of being like, knowing that those two people are somehow going to converge and both lose is, you know, unimaginable in the first third of the book where this guy's like, you know, sort of touring around France and then somebody else is living in like the place among the rocks in like whatever. Yeah, it's, it's weird, right? I mean, and they had these sort of parallel lives. They both end up in Arizona at the same time uh, earlier in the book. And I kind of, I wasn't sure if it was good. I mean, when I chose those people to write about in particular, how how it would work and if those were the right choices and you know a lot of writing a book like this turns out to be like deciding which of the many characters and they're not characters they're real people uh real lives that existed in this time and were connected to the story you focus on um but it turned out that the the lives that i was the most drawn to from a kind of storytelling wise, but also sort of just personally, I found them the most affecting and I was the most curious about them, uh, ran together in this really sort of, I guess, convenient way, uh, narrative wise. Yeah, the, so the one last thing I'll do about the book and then we're gonna do questions in just a minute, but it is, um, as I said, like a, a very unique way of telling it. And like, as somebody who, you know, has like read and like, edited your stuff been edited by you in the past and it's very much your style but it is also not like many or any other books not just sports books that I've, I've read what were there sort of touchstones was there something that you were aiming for a certain type of, of writer or style or type of book that you were thinking to yourself like I'd like to try to do something like that um I really wanted to be I wanted the book to be readable and like and accurate. Those are the two the two words that I think come to mind. Uh, not that ambitious. So, I the guess. soaring ambition. Of I know, uh, but no, it's 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 hard to make a, a book that's got all this complicated history in it readable, and um, hard to make it accurate. So, for me, while I was writing the book, I actually found that reading any like unrelated nonfiction that wasn't that wasn't purely research based would drive me crazy. Yeah. Like I picked up. I think I said this 
somebody recently, I picked up Susan Orlean's book, the library book at some point when I was, you know, still writing and it's about the LA library fire and a subject that I'm super interested in. And I, I love her work, but I read the first page and I was, I like, I had a physical reaction because it was so good. And I was like, oh God, she has, like, I can't she has see this right now. Like, of a suspect on the first page that's so detailed. And I'm writing about somebody who, you know, passed away in the early 70s and didn't speak English. I mean, I speak Spanish, but she, you know, didn't leave that kind of a, a legacy of, of um, for research. And I just, I shuddered and I had to stop. Uh, so I read fiction pretty much only while I was writing this. And yeah. I turn back, I'm a big fan of John Dos Passos' USA trilogy, and I think that informs sort of the jumping around you talked about a little bit. Um, and I read a lot of magical realism. I was trying to kind of get in the vibes a little bit. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I was, uh, the idea of not being able to read nonfiction for an entire year because your body is trying to produce it, and there's only so much of it in there, is extremely painful to think about. It's, it was, it was real, man. I couldn't handle it. <laughs> it sounds awful. Yeah, I saw Eric, the last time we were talking before we came on about the last time I saw him and it was, we had a, a delicious Mexican dinner, or not a Mexican, Indian food dinner in Culver City. And it was, it was very nice, but he was deep enough in it that he was just sort of like, I don't know, like I, I will finish the book, but I have no idea how that's going to happen. I'm still not sure how it happened. Yeah, but here it is. Uh, so yeah. we can do questions now um and i Bo is loading them up here uh eric i'm just going to read you a question and you can answer how's that sound buddy i'll give it my best all right um i wonder if the author can speak to the fact that o'malley did want to stay in brooklyn and build the first ever dome stadium with the help of buckminster fuller but when the dodgers were subsequently unable to secure the land on which to build the dome stadium as robert moses later kept pointing them away from brooklyn and towards flushing meadows o'malley looked for other solutions so the the well, that question Fuller speaks came, to it pretty well. Uh, yeah. So, but yeah. no, I, I, Buckminster Fuller was involved. I mean, uh, I think he had two different dome stadium designs. One was the Fuller design that was like the geodesic dome, and one was a more traditional dome stadium, which doesn't. I mean, you can't really conceive of a traditional dome stadium in the fifties, but they were clear domes too, which is really fascinating. Uh, O'Malley. I mean, I think the fact that he was thinking about building a Domed, a clear dome stadium uh, in Brooklyn in the 50s tells you about his ambition. Yeah. Uh, I think it tells you everything you need to know about his ambition. He, he did want to stay in Brooklyn and he wanted to stay in Brooklyn his way. Um, ultimately, Robert Moses made that impossible. Uh, O'Malley was asking for probably a lot. He wanted to, you know, he wanted to use some, some laws in a way that wasn't necessarily totally kosher to get the land um another pioneering move from a baseball owner there but but are you know uh didn't work out and now new york has the mets yeah and which is, that's informed your life so much it has it's why if i seem especially happy and high energy <laughs> that's because the mets are not it. playing right now it's because <laughs> yes it's just because i saw jay payton's first rbi and uh, that's carried me forward for 20 odd years <laughs> Um, so, all right, uh, our next question. Um, great book. He's Thank talking you. To, talking to you. Uh, totally enhanced by the focus on the individuals. Uh, Eric writes about going through various drafts. To what extent was he inspired by certain big, sprawling novels rather than nonfiction? You did answer that to a certain extent, but I'm curious about like trying to write a, a novelistic work of nonfiction, which I think you did sort of succeed in doing. Thank you. Can you think about that when you're doing it or are you just trying to, to get from one page to the next? I don't, I think I thought about it some. I mean, I wanted to write it somewhat novelistically. Like I hoped that people would care about the characters, you know, on an emotional level. And I keep on calling them characters. Once again, they're real. Uh, yeah. that, but it's a book, I mean. It's a book and they're, they're figures, you know, that's the word I should be using. So I wanted them to come off the page and I wanted readers to, feel what they felt to an extent, you know, that you can transfer empathy uh, while writing. And I also wanted, you know, one of the lessons that I learned that like I had to learn before I could write a book was that like stuff has to happen in a story. And um, it's true, like there has to be movement, there has to be, you know, pacing and there has to, there has to be a sense of, of progress. Um, and I think I really wanted 
the reader to feel that like the story was building towards something. Obviously, you know, it's literally building towards Dodger Stadium, but in a more kind of unspoken sense, reading novels, um, you know, the USA trilogy, again, I mentioned was probably a big part of it. Uh, there was an earlier draft of the book that was a lot more like postmoderny, uh, where I kind of written myself into it. And I like this book called HHHH by Laurent Benet, a French novel about the assassination of the Nazi commander Heydrich. It's a very weird novel, but it's great. And he has these short chapters also where he, and he writes about himself all the time throughout the book. It's like kind of one of those meta books. And I tried that and it didn't work at all for me. That's too bad. Anybody who had, uh, I know there was a prop bet on when you would mention Laurent Benet in the, in the <laughs> Q&A. So the answer is 1.49 p.m. Eastern time. Please collect your winnings. Uh, the next question. Uh, thank you for your excellent book. As a New Yorker, it was, ex it was interesting to see the parallel exploitations of both Brooklyn and Los Angeles. Was the issue that LA and Moses had different visions for their respective cities? I mean, I think the question actually is really interestingly framed. Does LA have a different vision from a very particular person, Robert Moses? I think the difference in that is that in LA, power was less centralized. Um, power was up, more up for grabs in the 50s in LA. And I think this book hopefully reflects the fact that it wasn't necessarily a guarantee that it would have gone this way in LA, whereas with New York, and I, I truly am not an expert on Robert Moses. Um, and I think Same. people watching this probably really are. So I don't want to speak too much, but he, you know, was literally kind of deemed as all powerful. Uh, and I think the reason that these events happened in LA is because you had different sort of factions and different visions for the city competing. Uh, and that left some people kind of out in the lurch. Yeah, I, um, this is something, another thing just to take everybody inside the game uh, Eric and I, when we were talking about it, he was like, you should know I have not read The Power Broker. And I was like, it's okay, I haven't read it either. I've I'm read parts of The Power Broker. I haven't read the whole Power Broker. Yeah. The relevant well, I've, parts. I've read parts of Ulysses, too. That's why I always tell <laughs> people I've read Ulysses. The, um, <laughs> all right, the, moving on uh, from Robert Moses. In a just world, and I realize we live in one far from that, what would you like to see the Dodgers or the city of Los Angeles do to honor and preserve the history of Palo Verde, La Loma, and Bishop communities? and the families like the Arachigas that comprise them? And what do you think, think the likelihood of that is? I, I don't know. I don't know if it's likely or not. I, I would say that the Dodgers and the city and the county, probably and the state and the federal government, uh, should all acknowledge that this happened. It was, they should like, apologize, just say this was bad. We did, we did, that, that would be a very simple first step. Uh, it is not up to me to decide what's enough. I'm not a member of those communities. I would say that there are active you know descendants and members of those communities still who could answer that question uh there's a nonprofit called buried under the blue started by uh, one of abrana's descendants uh and you know they've suggested that the dodgers in the city could put together money to build uh three community centers one for each community that was displaced um i think that sounds like a good idea yeah. but i i once again would say that i'm not the person to decide what's appropriate there That's a good answer and a good question. Uh, next question would be, explain in more detail how the Red Scare derailed the plan for public housing. Thanks. Sure, so the plan for public housing, uh, a lot of it stemmed from a housing bill that Harry Truman signed, uh, the National Housing Act in 1949, and that provided funding for a lot of cities to build big public housing projects. And in LA, you know, uh, there's gonna be 10,000 units of housing. So about 3,600 in this particular project, but there were other projects around the city. The opponents to public housing at the time were mainly private real estate developers, as you can imagine. Uh, one guy I write about in some detail in the books, his name is Fritz Burns, and he's super fascinating uh, on his own right. There's a good book about him called, I think like Fritz Burns and the Development of Los Angeles by James Keene. If you want to learn about LA's development, I recommend it a lot. Uh, so he and kind of other anti-public housing activists or sort of people who were opposed to public housing literally started a nonprofit or whatever, a political organization called CASH, Citizens Against Socialist Housing. Um, the it's campaign to, to stop public acronym. housing was, it was so deeply, I know it's a perfect acronym, yeah. deeply tied into to kind of anti-communist hysteria. and. 
it was just really like a political calculation. I, I don't think there's a lot of evidence that any of the quote unquote anti communist anti housing people really cared that much about communism. It was just a, a way to score points and a way to sort of argue for you know the private home in, industry and and it worked yep, which is well weak, but there it is. next question would be uh hi Eric hi. Yeah, good. And thanks. On Twitter, you've mentioned that this book is in some ways an extension of or the culmination of a project you started back with your blog, Pictures and Poets. Hell yeah. Oh, wow. Getting nice. deep into the my it's, a good way, it's a good website. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how your writing style has evolved or stayed the same as you've grown as a writer and editor and now that helped you take on such an ambitious project? I think my writing has improved a lot. I hope so. And my, I really, when I started that blog, I wasn't really much of a reporter yet. I was just a blogger. I, I wrote a lot about myself and my feelings and I'm no longer particularly interested in doing that. Uh, it's worth situating the blog. Everybody blog, was writing about themselves and their feelings. It's true. At it was that 2009. Time. Things yeah. have changed. Uh, I, I think I, in terms of how the book grew from, from that project, I was really interested in how kind of, like baseball fits in with our lives and fits in with society and like what does it all mean uh, in the context of baseball and sports and the baseball parts of this book which we haven't really talked about at all are yeah. um you know they're about baseball but they're really about like why baseball became such an important thing for la um and for the country in the 50s and i try to trace the story of baseball a little bit in la and, and in mexico um leading up to the construction of Dodger Stadium in a way that you might understand, or I hope you would, you would kind of feel why it was so urgent to so many people in LA that there was a Dodger Stadium, that they got the Brooklyn Dodgers, that, that this kind of institution um, became part of LA. Yeah, the uh, baseball so, stuff really is ahead. interesting too. I'm sorry if I left it out because there's this it's this crazy wildcatting spirit in stadiums in amusement parks, minor league teams moving away and coming back and everything like that. So there's always a baseball crazy town. It was just like somehow not major league by those standards. Yeah, and also like major league was such an East Coast thing. Like right. the National League and American League, you know, they were they were Midwest sort of by the 50s they had like reached kansas city and places like that but it was really a it was it was not a national enterprise yet despite it being the national pastime yeah uh all right sorry i left all the baseball stuff out there's some really good baseball stuff in there too duke <laughs> snyder willie davis um all your favorites uh all right first time long time Terrific. Always wanted to read that. Can you think of an ongoing sports adjacent story that's happening right now that could wind up as a stealing home style saga in 60 years? I'll hang up and listen. Yeah. How about, how about like um, what's happening right now with whether we restart sports or not? I think, yeah. <laughs> um, I think when the NFL decides to like start playing to full stadiums in September, despite everybody telling them not to, uh, that'll be the book. Um, yeah. In terms of stadiums and development, I mean, in LA you have Inglewood and that sort of like the transition of Inglewood into this like kind of corporate sports state uh, has been really interesting to watch. Um, but I don't know yet how it's gonna play out with the Clippers new arena there. Um, you know, I don't know when the new football stadium is gonna open. I think that the story of sort of power and money um, wielding influence in poor neighborhoods for the benefit of sports owners is universal and will certainly still be happening in 60 years. Yeah. Uh, all right. Next question. Uh, phrased as a, as a cross-examination, interestingly. Isn't it true that when you're inside the stadium and get tickets for the top deck, you can't travel to the other decks? If so, how is that populist? Oh, it's not populist at all. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's true. I think they actually, I think one of the ideas was they were going to change that this year with the new uh, renovations. Dodger Stadium was supposed to open a few weeks ago with like a whole different vibe and $100 million renovation. Um, one of my childhood pastimes was sneaking down to the lower decks. At the time, the populist version of that uh, was, and I don't, I don't recall if that was how it was when Dodger Stadium opened, 
was that you could, so the Dodger Stadium parking lots that surround the stadium are, are tiered. And this has not been the case during my lifetime, but theoretically, back in the day, you would park on the tier of your lot and walk straight into to your deck. So if you're in the top deck, you'd park at the top deck, you have a short walk, and then you could walk back out to your car and it would be really painless. Now, if you go to a Dodger game, you end up hiking like five miles to get yeah. from your car to the stadium. Uh, and then you end up having to like walk around the whole stadium to get to your seat. But I think the idea at the time was very much parking oriented. Uh, but I, I agree, yeah, not being able to like move freely around the stadium is the opposite of populist. Yeah, also I used the word populist, he didn't use it, that's my fault. Um, so if you wanna yell at anybody, Oh, I will. All right, cool. Yeah, thanks. I wasn't asking you to yell at me. <laughs> All right, uh, next question. How did, <laughs> how did Walter O'Malley get Horace Stoneham to join him on the westward move? What was the name of the Mexican family who refused to move? We covered that a factor in having teams move could be the changing demographics of the neighborhood where they were originally located. Uh, for example, under the shadow of the senators. I'm not sure I followed that. Let me I take the, uh, so you want to take it in order? Um, uh, how did O'Malley get Stoneham to join him? I don't know the like full details. I didn't focus on it that much in the book. Um, there's some books about that out there. Um, but my understanding is that Stoneham was thinking about going to Minneapolis and that O'Malley kind of said, how about San Francisco? And the city of San Francisco was willing to build Candlestick Park uh, for the Giants and rent it out to them, I think, extremely cheap. And Stoneham went for that. Um, I think he liked the idea of being a pioneer too. And I think from what I can understand, Stoneham was like a pretty easygoing guy. He was not, not like Walter O'Malley in that regard. He um, was very willing to take a big, ugly, horseshoe shaped stadium that had wind problems that the city built for him. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Yeah, which is, all right, so the other parts of that question, uh, the family that refused to move was the Arechigas. I can feel that one. Uh, and then talks about the changing demographics of the neighborhood where they were originally located. The sense of the idea of like the Dodgers outgrowing Brooklyn is something that I, I always like have instinctively rejected. And yet it seems like there was something, I was shocked at how bad the attendance was at Ebbets Field by the end. Yeah, by the end it was bad, but they weren't really taking good care of the stadium either. Like it was the kind of thing where like uh, when the Sonics left Seattle, attendance wasn't great that final year, partly because like the Sonics ownership was sort of like half-assing it. Uh, and I think O'Malley was to an extent with Ebbets Field half-assing it, not because he w necessarily wanted to go to LA, but because he wanted a new stadium and he wasn't going to keep investing in a very old one. Yeah. Um, in terms of the neighborhood demographics, I think that's a myth that came in afterwards. I think it was one of those things that sports writers who were mad wrote. Um, you know, you have to realize a lot of sports writers in New York papers lost their jobs when the Dodgers left and lost their sort of brands. Uh, so of course they would be upset at Walter O'Malley, rightfully. And O'Malley uh, famously, and I think this is in Bums, uh, but I'm not sure, told his son Peter to not worry about people would saying he was a racist, saying this and that, that he left for those reasons um, because you know of what they were gonna build in LA. And I, the idea that, I mean, he left Flatbush because of the changing neighborhood demographics it seems a little bit far-fetched to me and uh, kind of conspiratorial. Yeah. Uh, all right, the next question. Um, how many uh, people were displaced? Also, someone told me that some of the houses in Chavez Ravine were sold to studios and ended up as sets, including in the Gregory Peck to Kill a Mockingbird. I also was told that by a book that I read. Uh, is, is this the most LA thing ever or the most LA thing ever? It's definitely the most LA thing ever. <laughs> I actually, okay, so that is, um, there were about 1,100 families in three communities. Most of them had been displaced before Dodger Stadium entered the picture. They were mostly displaced by Elysian Park Heights, the housing project that never existed. Um, there were about a couple dozen families left at the very end. Um, most of them ended up getting payouts. Uh, a few of them were forcibly evicted, like the Adechiga family. In terms of the Kill Mockingbird story, I've heard that too. and. I talked about this with Sam Miller on the Effectively Wild podcast uh, a few weeks ago, and a film historian wrote to him and found uh, an actual New York Times story about these houses that had been, in 1962, still standing around Dodger Stadium, and that was the year Dodger Stadium opened, 
and they were actually rolled to Universal Studios to become part of the To Kill a Mockingbird set. And Universal was bragging about saving money by creating an authentic Southern town with pre-existing houses. So it is the most LA thing ever. Yeah. And it did the, happen. The image of that in the book is very powerful and, and kind of jarringly like visually strange of the houses being just pumped up on jacks and then just taken wherever like before the ones that wound up on lots it seems like that was how a lot of the families moved yeah well a lot of them didn't move that way a lot of them just sold their houses to the government and then the government sold them to people so like you you, you didn't necessarily get oh, to bring so your house with you you the government bought your house and then resold it to like somebody in like whittier to and, have for their and house. they moved it there at that yeah houses that, would get moved around wow. the city a lot at the time it's that, it's kind of crazy but it, it was normal yeah a lot of most la things ever happening there uh, i guess both gonna keep giving us questions so let's keep rocking uh yeah. I, kn I know the incredible confluence of events is key to what makes the book so fascinating but if the stadium didn't come together this way would it have just happened some other way given how the city elites wanted baseball and the need for the sport to eventually reach the coast yeah, I think it would have happened some other way. I mean, I don't know what would have happened with those communities, um, with that land, uh, like no idea. There was a lot of idea. I mean, there was a lot of kind of stuff thrown out there. They were gonna build a college there, an airport, a cemetery, which would have been kind of sad and appropriate. Yeah. Um, but the LA Zoo could have been there. But um, yeah, baseball would have happened in LA eventually. And it might not have been the Dodgers. You know, when they came in 58, the city was still not sure. There was a vote uh, over the legality of this deal, giving this public land to selling the public land to O'Malley. And it was really close. It was 52% to 48%. I mean, it was not um, universally like the deal was welcomed with open arms in LA. So there's very, it's very easy to imagine in LA where this Dodger Stadium does not get built. I mean, it's, it's not far-fetched at all to think that way. Yeah, that's interesting. So we got another few questions uh, that I will read here. Um, all right, what did the players think of the move to Brooklyn from LA? Were they supportive of it? I think, I don't really know. I, I think some were and some weren't. I mean, if some of the guys were from LA, uh, ironically, one of the guys I write about is Duke Snyder, who's from Compton, and he was not thrilled because he loved living in Brooklyn and he was a huge hero. Uh, so he goes home basically, but it wasn't necessarily like where he wanted to be at the time. Yeah. There's, he as a, a Los Angeles person and then Willie Davis is another sort of, as a person who also came from, from Arkansas to Los Angeles as like sort of, there's a, a nice bit of the, the job basically of center field for the Dodgers moving between those two. Yeah, so Willie Davis grew up in, in L.A. in a housing project, actually, in Boyle Heights. And, you know, Duke Snyder grew up in Compton. When Compton was a segregated town, it was a whites-only city. And he sort of cedes the position to Willie Davis, uh, kind of when the Dodgers get to L.A. And Snyder sort of gradually, like, moves to the corner outfield spots and then gets traded to the Mets. And Willie Davis cements himself as the center fielder of the future in L.A. So uh, our next question, loving the book so far, and thank you for the fun trading card. That's, we should mention oh, yeah. the illustrations. Uh, would either of you have book recommendations on either a similar theme or at the very least good baseball reads? I'll let you go first. Oh man. Um, if you wanna like read more about this after reading my book, uh, there's a book called City of Dreams that came out a few years ago by Gerald Poder. He's a professor in Wisconsin and he wrote a book that's a lot it, it's like zoomed in much more on the politics and on the kind of like processes that led to the Dodgers coming and to the sort of city hall egos and machinations. Uh, I would say that that's a good accompanying uh, read. And then if you want a good Dodger book that stems from this one, uh, there's one called The Last Innocence about the Dodgers of the 60s by a guy named Michael Leahy that like picks up kind of where this book ends. Um, but I... I don't know. Let, what do you think, Dave? You're, you're more well-read than I am. Is that true? I don't know. It, it looks <laughs> like there's a lot of books behind That's the me, beard of a literary scholar. Yeah, it's the beard of a guy who doesn't have to go out very much anymore, uh, if we're going to be honest about it. I don't know. I feel like the... In, I haven't read as many baseball books of late. I mean, this book, I think, with the... Uh, I was talking with your friend and mine, Corbin Smith, about it, and he compared it to, to Mike Davis, 
who's kind of the sort of academic scholar scold of Los Angeles. And I, I think it's a much uh, warmer and more sort of human literary experience than that. But if the way that the sort of like, uh, if Los Angeles especially is your area of interest on this, that like, I, City of Courts really is great. I read it in college, I haven't read it since, but like, it's to me is a remarkable book about that. It's a very, it's a very remarkable book. It's also like a bummer. So yeah, be ready for that. A big time bummer. Uh, a lot of, a lot of people, if you, if you liked watching communities lose out to powerful interests and you're like, I'd like to see that six or eight more times across this great American city. <laughs> that's, um, yeah. All right. Let's we can move on to the next. Oh, and in terms of baseball books, I just started uh, Brad Baluchian's The Wax Pack, which is like the opposite of uh, Eric's book, but it's just a guy uh, ripping a pack of baseball cards and then going in search of all the players that he finds in there. And it's a delight so far. I mean, I'm 20 pages in, but the, uh, all right. Um, next question here. Uh, what's the lesson for cities and owners today from this experience? SoFi Stadium comes to mind. <laughs> that you think owners are going to learn lessons from this? Yeah, experience? right. This is, it's so hard to talk about this stuff now. Or <laughs> like, oh, they're going to try harder. It's cities like too, for that matter. I yeah, mean, it's the same. But... I, I think that they should care about the people who live in the communities where the teams are. Um, I think that's a lesson that owners still need to learn, even if they're not building stadiums. Just like think about average people. Think about people sometimes who are not like not just as dollar signs. That would be a, a good start. Yeah, it seems like the trend is so very much away from that. Like the because teams don't make money off attendance necessarily anymore. It's all regional sports networks and television. I mean, the Dodgers have definitely done that. So like yeah. prioritizing an affordable, easy baseball experience is like not, you know, like anybody's goal, it seems at this point. Yeah, I mean, and a, an easy, affordable NFL experience is even harder to imagine, to be honest. Oh my God, yeah. I mean, that's definitely a sport that can just be without fans much more readily than baseball, I think. All right, so I am being told, uh, you're giving me the light. So this is our last question. All right. Um, so oh, this is actually somehow for me. Uh, wow. D David, did witnessing that historic Jay Payton moment keep you in the unfortunate <laughs> don't trade him for Gary Sheffield camp in 2001? I'm not going to, I don't have to answer that question uh, because I didn't write the book. So I can, as far as you know, I definitely wanted the Mets to trade for Gary Sheffield in 2001 and was not uh, really upset about the idea of them parting with a future fourth outfielder, but I was very upset by that prospect. And uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, you wind up like sort of imprinted on players. Uh, Peyton wasn't really that good, but I, I did like him a lot. Do you have like Dodgers that you like guys that you saw come up at like a formative time where you're just like a Chad Fonville guy for life now? Oh man, I'm always always a Chad Fonville guy. He didn't stick around that long. I wish no. he did. Yeah, he was fun. It was the rabbit. Uh, that was, I think that was Vince Scully's nickname for him. I think there was like one, one season of Chad Fonville and then he was gone practically. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you want to just, um, now that we're, we're ending here, do you want to just say the name of a Dodger player and I'll say the name of a Dodger player? You can go first. Just any, any Dodger player yeah, from sure. any era. We were talking yeah. about Todd Hollinsworth earlier. We were. And I, uh, and then uh, we were also talking about the prospect of either you or I wearing uh, an Eric Caros jersey during this. And I, I, do have, I do own an Eric Caros jersey and it's, it's in another room. In this yeah. I think it's night. for the best that we didn't. Uh, so this is it. Uh, would you like to tell people where and how they can get this book? Yeah, the book is called Stealing Home and it is available from any place books are sold. Um, I would recommend buying it from your local independent bookstore or going to bookshop.org and finding it there or IndieBound. Uh, First of all, those places need need your support, especially right now. And second of all, Amazon is busy sen sending essential gloves to people. So uh, go buy it, buy it locally, please. Yeah, but do buy it. It's really good. He can't say it because he's so polite and nice, but it's a it's a fantastic book. Thanks Thank for uh, thanks for talking. Thanks for thanks for uh, I was going to say having me, but agreeing to do this with me. Right, I was going to say, and thanks to the Brooklyn Historical Society for showing us how to use Zoom. Yeah, we appreciate it so much. <laughs> Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye.